I'm Paul Caldwell from Richmond, Virginia and Tucker Orthopedics uh, at Orthopedic Research of Virginia. I'm honored to be part of this program. Um, we've got a great faculty um, here tonight. I'd like to thank Varicel for giving us such a great platform to discuss cartilage injury. And um, my goal tonight is to give you a short overview of the Macy procedure, um, as well as cartilage pathology. And hold on, here we go. Just in case you're new to Macy, I wanted to cover some basic information to give you an idea of what Macy is about and how it fits into your practice. Macy is a cellular sheath that consists of characterized autologous chondrocytes seated on a three by five resorbable porcine membrane that's made from type one and type three collagen. The autologous chondrocytes are propagated in a cell culture and are seated on a collagen membrane with a density of 500,000 to a million per centimeter squared. The Macy implant is trimmed by the surgeon to the exact size of the shape of the defect. I don't want to go into great detail here because we're going to cover this later in the program, but I wanted to give you a review of the key steps just so you'll better understand what we're going to go ahead with tonight. The process begins with an arthroscopic assessment of the cartilage lesion and the remainder of the knee, as well as a harvest of the cartilage biopsy from a minor or non-weight-bearing healthy area of the knee. Next, the biopsy specimen is shipped to the manufacturing facility where the autologous chondrocytes are isolated, cultured, and seeded onto the collagen membrane. When the time comes, the final Macy product may be implanted through a small open incision. Although Macy may be new to you, this is the third generation of technology that's been around since the early 1990s with good results that have been and has been approved by the FDA in the United States as Macy since 2016. Now that we looked at the history of Macy and what the process involved, we can briefly look at which cartilage defects are appropriate for Macy. Macy can be utilized for cartilage lesions of the knee that are full thickness and greater than two centimeters squared with and without bone loss. It's been approved for all cartilage surfaces of the knee and it's great for patients with multiple cartilage defects, particularly on hard to access areas such as the tibial plateau and irregular surfaces like the patellofemoral joint. Now that we're familiar with Macy, let's discuss what you need to know about a stage procedure. If you're going to take care of patients with knee injuries, particularly specializing in sports medicine or arthroscopy, you've got to be well versed in talking to people about cartilage injuries and treatment. You've got to understand that focal cartilage defects occur in about 75% of people undergoing arthroscopy. About 50% athletes having an ACL reconstruction have a concomitant cartilage defect. And if these defects are left untreated, Articular cartilage can progress, uh, limit sports participation, as well as active lifestyles later. So it's very important, and I think that's why you all are attending. As with everything we discuss with patients, there's a right way to approach things, and there's a right way to approach, or a wrong way to approach things. When I talked about fellow, when I teach the fellows about how to discuss cartilage lesion with patients, I often tell them this is how to avoid losing a patient to a second opinion really cartilage treatment psychology 101, and you've got to approach this in the right way or you'll completely uh, scare the patient. Um, I think first and foremost, you've got to set, set aside time. This is not a two or three minute discussion. This is not from the edge of the doorway. You've really got to sit down with the patient and really explain things to them um, because there's a lot of ground to cover here. I'll often offer a follow-up phone call just because there's so much information and you can't always cover it with the patient in the office. I think you've got to really explain to them that even though they're feeling better with rest, their symptoms may recur with activity and this may not be the end of this. You've got to explain that cartilage damage doesn't heal on its own and it certainly can progress uh, if it's not treated. I think the toughest thing for me, particularly people who are sent in, it's the first time I've ever seen them, is really explaining that the MRI is not a 100% test. Letting them know that we don't have all the information to make a plan and make important decisions about their knee. I think if you really boil it down to letting them know that this decision is really crucial and all the information is necessary to make this decision, they really get an understanding that the MRI may not be enough. You've got to explain their factors inside the knee and you've got to explain their factors outside the knee. And we'll talk a little bit about those tonight. You've got to exchange single stage treatment, which can include chondroplasty or osteochondral autograft. And then you've got to explain two stage treatment, which can include obviously Macy or osteochondral allograft in my practice particularly. 
And I always tell the fellows um, things that you don't start off with. You don't walk into the room and say, hey, I think you're going to need two surgeries because you'll, you'll, they'll be out the door before you know it. You also don't start the conversation with we're going to cut your femur bone or your tibia bone into. That's also a great way to lose a patient. So let's talk about more details about how we go about this conversation. One of my favorite aspects of Macy is the literature that they provide to me to hand out to patients in the office. I've noticed that many patients are often stunned once they learn about their cartilage injury and don't always recall the details of our discussion. The Macy literature allows the patient to review the literature on their own time and link to the website to get more information and support if they wish. I'll often tell patients that the website has more information about Macy than they ever want to know. After they've read the literature, I offer a follow-up phone call to answer questions, and many patients take me up on this. I think the fact that you're willing to call the patient, take the time to really discuss things, often going over things that you've already talked to them about in the office, really makes a difference to the patient, and it builds confidence in the process, particularly if you're a young physician just starting out. I realize that most of you are attending this webinar to learn about the clinical aspects of Macy, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about my favorite part of the Macy process, which is the insurance approval support they offer for your staff, as well as the patient support to answer non-medical questions and additional clinical research sources through my cartilage care. As long as you and your office staff provides the proper documentation, I've found that most of Macy cases are always approved and rarely need appeal or peer to peer. And this is a welcome change from the hostile environment of other cartilage procedures that I perform. This is coupled with the fact that the majority of these procedures can be done in the outpatient surgery center, which is a tremendous benefit. When talking to patients about cartilage injury, I find it helpful to use analogies that they'll understand. Because using typical medical terms can often confuse them and lead them uncertainty about and anxiety about treatment, I'll often use the analogy that Teflon coating to a potter pan that allows easy sliding. And once this Teflon coating is scratched or chipped, the surface can no longer slide and is no longer smooth, and the other bones can get damaged from this area. Patients need to understand that healthy cartilage is an avascular tissue and does not have the ability to heal or regenerate without blood supply. They need to understand that this is completely different from bone that does have a great blood supply and certainly can heal. I'll explain that a hole in the cartilage causes stress on the surrounding cartilage and taking up the load, this cartilage will eventually fail and the hole will get bigger and bigger. And this can cause symptoms such as catching, popping, clicking, giving way, swelling, and pain. Patients must understand that even though they may have had a single injury and the pain has subsided, that the symptoms will recur if they become more active. Often the tougher conversation is the explanation that the process has been going on for years in their knee and they've only recently had symptoms. Explaining that this is a process is important and that symptoms most likely will get worse unless we intervene to slow down the progression. Often we'll use the pothole in the road analogy to help patients understand the progression and the need to patch the hole. Educating the patient about factors around the cartilage injury that will affect the results of treatment is also very important. We know that meniscal injury deficiency, malalignment, and ligamentous instability are known to contribute to the development of articular lesions, and if these are not addressed before or at the time of Macy implantation, the likelihood of cartilage survival is certainly less. The way I typically lead into this discussion is to explain that we are creating a home for new cartilage cells to live, and we want to make this home the best place that we can for the cells to grow up and mature. This typically makes sense to patients. If you do not address these additional factors, then the new cells are more likely to fail and the outcome is going to be suboptimal. So a lot of the things we need to do at the same time are rational. I really like the stool analogy when treating cartilage lesion. If one leg is missing or not addressed, then the whole stool will fall. I know that Scott's gonna talk a lot more about the diagnostic arthroscopy, but I use this to confirm that the patient is indeed a candidate for Macy, even though I talked to him about this preoperatively. My fellows give me a hard time because I take so many pictures in surgery, but I explain to them that you're really telling a story to the patient and a picture's worth a thousand words. Getting good quality pictures 
um, with an arthroscopic ruler, it helps not only to explain the pathology to the patient, but it's also great for your records to review if the time from harvest to implantation is lengthy. It's also beneficial to show the insurance company just in case you have to fight for your patient's approval. We also need to assess factors outside the knee as well. Getting to know the patient, understanding their personality towards the cartilage lesion is essential. Macy's approved for patients under 55 years of age. Even though I used to think 55 was really old, it now seems very young to me and plenty of my patients wanna stay active as they age. I know, the talk, I know that talking to patients about weight loss is difficult, but I find myself more than ever performing a diagnostic arthroscopy and biopsy, but waiting on the patient to lose weight before implantation. The weight loss talk seems to be more meaningful to the patient after they've actually seen their arthroscopic pictures and explaining if they don't reduce the load on the implanted cells that the procedure may have suboptimal results. We should also consider the patient's profession. We have to consider they have to take time off for work from their work as well as uh, for the surgery postoperatively. And they've gotta be able to follow the postoperative restrictions. Being upfront with patients regarding the length of time until return to sports as well as work is paramount before you ever go down this journey. You've got to talk to them about high impact versus low impact sports and the need for um, prior to implantation. I also emphasize to the patient that we really got five years to reimplant these cells so we can see how much relief the arthroscopy gives the patient before proceeding. We already talked about assessing the rest of the knee and Scott's gonna elaborate on that. We rarely discuss this, but the patient's psychology changes after they've seen the arthroscopic pictures, the size of the defect, as well as the normal cartilage. They're more accepting of a larger procedure and a lengthy rehabilitation if the scope does not relieve their symptoms. You can also assess the patient's resilience during the rehabilitation from the arthroscopy and judge if they'd be a, bigger, a, a better candidate for a larger procedure and a longer recovery. If the patient's really struggling with the recovery from the scope, then I'd be very hesitant to proceed with a Macy implantation. Sharing with them a Macy handout for rehabilitation before the implantation is also helpful to ensure they're adequately informed and ready for the journey. I'd like to turn the program over to Scott to talk about the diagnostic arthroscopy with the interarticular evaluation in the knee. Thanks for your attention. So I'm going to really talk basic setup, arthroscopic assessment of the knee, and then the actual procedure of the biopsy, as well as the logistics that go with getting the biopsy to where it's going to be uh, uh, arriving to get uh, at, at varicell and to be able to be uh, uh, placed on the membrane. So we'll talk about what you need to do ahead of time, what you need to have ready, um, review the clinical findings. We're going to talk about the assessment of the knee. Um, how it fits into the planning that you talk uh, with the patient about, and then the actual procedure itself. So what do you need to do ahead of time? Let's say you're just starting out and you say, gee, I, I want to be available to, to be able to do this. Here's some instruments and, and concepts you need to set up. So obviously we use a standard arthroscopy setup, um, routine additions for any planned procedure that you have, special things, ACLs, whatever. But then specifically, you want to make sure that you have a measuring device, as, uh, as Paul showed, things that have uh, parameters on them. Um, you can see these various probes here that have uh, five millimeter increments or even more fine, uh, a small uh, arthroscopic gouge or a ring curette, obviously a ruler, um, a grasper to be able to uh, take biopsy tissue. These are the only specialized things you need, as well as having uh, an, the ability to send the sample which fortunately the varicell reps will be very helpful to have that done. But once you have this set up, you call them your cartilage biopsy instruments, your ORs can have those available to you and uh, whenever you need it. And I think, so that's just something you need to set up to start with. So then um, the intraarticular evaluation, obviously you wanna review your clinical findings ahead of time so that you know kind of what to expect. It also helps you um, to be able to counsel the patients, much like Paul was talking about, um, to be able to talk about the kind of things that, that might be um, apparent at the time of arthroscopy. You want to look at the characteristics of the patient, the duration of symptoms, what treatments they've had previous, for example, 
a prior micro fracture might lead to an intralesional osteophyte, as you see right here. And that uh, certainly, sh that's in the middle of a chondral defect. So that can make a difference in what you might talk about. Their age, make sure that they fit in the, uh, uh, the 17 or 18 to 55 age group, what their activity level is, and what their expectation and goals are. If their expectations are, no matter what, to uh, uh, continue to run marathons and, uh, and train real competitively as a runner, that's, that's not something that we can uh, necessarily promise. So you really need to adjust those expectations in someone like that. Um, when it gets to the procedure itself, uh, don't forget, like you do in all cases, exam under anesthesia, um, measure your range of motion, your stability, your patellar mobility, um, note effusion, cruciates, uh, the status of the meniscus, the status of all the other compartments, um, the tracking, and these are all things to include in your, in your op note. I can't tell you how many times I've gone back um, down the road when a patient doesn't do well. And having this information consistently in your op report makes a difference and be able to decide about, uh, about whether or not they're a candidate for cartilage repair. Even simple things like, um, like here, this assessment here of small cartilage defect back there and you see the meniscus popping out. Um, obviously that's something that uh, uh, you'd have to repair the meniscus before you could uh, have any chance of doing anything for that um, chondral defect. So again, the things that we'll look at inside contained versus uncontained. Uh, uncontained is when a lesion kind of runs off the end, doesn't really have the firm rim around it. That would be the uncontained edge. Um, we want to look for uh, any bone loss that's present. Um, we want to look uh, at what the quality of the subchondral bone is. We want to assess for, um, so, so here's a lesion that's a, a bipolar lesion on the tibia and the femur. Obviously, these are degenerative changes. This is severe chondropenia, where the cartilage is thinned uh, on the tibia, making not a bed for cartilage repair. The same thing in the femur. The meniscus is macerated. This knee is probably not a candidate for uh, any kind of cartilage repair or at least not with, uh, with, with Macy at this point. Um, we wanna get our size. Um, there's a, a difference between the small lesions and the larger lesions. Um, we don't want those kissing lesions as we just talked about, uh, or any evidence of ebernated bone. Um, we look for bony involvement, uh, pretty much six millimeters or less is something that we can still manage with, um, with cartilage repair. But if it's any deeper than that, you may need uh, some de degree of bone grafting, whether it's done at the same time, the so-called sandwich technique, um, or whether or not um, um, it's something that can be treated uh, uh, with another method uh, for cartilage repair. Remember that the, the matrix that comes back is will cover lesions about 10 square centimeters. So if you have two defects, or um, obviously a very large defect, but two defects, you need to be doing this in your mind because you may need two implants um, when, when the time comes to come back and, and do the defect. So you wanna look at the, uh, the, the dimensions so you can figure the surface area. And, and even though it's not exact measurement, we pretty much do length times width. And uh, that's our square, uh, our square centimeters. Don't forget, as you assess the patient, you want to go through the factors that Paul mentioned, alignment, stability, the status of the articular cartilage, meniscal function. And this is kind of the rating system that I go through in any patient to see kind of where they lie and what treatment they might need. Um, if a chondral lesion is considered appropriate for Macy, then the chondral biopsy is going to be performed. Now, one of the things that, that I'll tell patients is, if you do a chondral biopsy, and, and I've done you know, four figures of, of chondral biopsies, it's, it's honest when, when you tell a patient, you wouldn't know I did a chondral biopsy unless I told you. It really doesn't have um, anything that, uh, that causes ongoing problems. So you say, we're gonna take the biopsy, we're gonna put it on ice and see how you do, as Paul mentioned. And I think it's never wrong to, to say that and say we're not obligated to use it, but we wanna have it there in case we need it in our armamentarium to, uh, to be able to treat you. And when you tell them they're really not gonna have any kind of uh, disability from the biopsy, patients are very well calmed by that and they are glad to have something that is, is kind of modern medicine that uh, when you tell them it's gonna be on liquid nitrogen and 
you know, frozen for in case they ever need it. They really like that. So, um, so don't hesitate to have that discussion. And even when you have low probability, you, you might just casually mention if you had something totally unexpected. Um, a cartilage defect that was not evident on the MRI, was not evident uh, beforehand, or something changed, that you might take a chondral biopsy to keep options open. And patients never mind that as long as you've talked about it ahead of time. Um, so intraoperative decision-making, um, we look for the cartilage defects that are appropriate and best treated for Macy. Um, you figure that, uh, that any one of these defects are good candidates. Um, and so you're going to go ahead and, and proceed with the biopsy. Go ahead and finish what you're there for. I think it's best to do, I mean, if you're there for an ACL or whatever you're there for, to go ahead and do the procedure you came for and then, um, and then take your, your cartilage biopsy at the end. We'll go through techniques. Just so you know, this is a CPT code. People have different ways of doing this, but I've built this CPT code uh, probably a couple thousand times. And this is what it reads. Um, it reads uh, uh, soft tissue biopsy, thigh or knee, deep. That's certainly what it is. And uh, it's 5.87 RVUs. And uh, so that's what I use uh, for an arthroscopic uh, chondral biopsy. And uh, I have really not had a problem for it. As you find the cartilage defect, if you're going to do treatment, what certainly there's literature for and what works is a chondroplasty and edge stabilization. I call it edge stabilization because you're doing like, like Paul mentioned before, this flap is gonna propagate. So if we don't get rid of this flap, this defect is gonna become bigger in the meantime when you're kind of deciding what to do. So by, by taking a banana blade and making a sharp edge, taking small curettes and making a sharp demarcation of the edge actually gives it a greater chance of, of doing some kind of healing with the blood that's inside the knee and it certainly kept, keeps from propagation. So that's edge stabilization. I think it's important. Do not do a microfracture just for the heck of it. Uh, do not do a microfracture just so you can do something. That's, it's an operation that, that there's far more things we could talk about on that. We could talk about that for an hour, but that's not an appropriate thing for a, a defect that you're gonna go on to treat with a biologic repair. It, it leads to poorer results. And, and certainly um, it has its ramifications. Um, <clears throat> for example, people throw a, a microfracture on top of somebody who's a plumber and then expect them that they're gonna be non-weight bearing for four weeks as they work on uh, continuous motion. Well, they can't do that because they're gonna go out of business if that happens. So you've really made them worse. Then they're more likely to have that, uh, that interlesional osteophyte or things like that. So do not just rely on a microfracture. Edge stabilization, justified procedure, literature that shows results of the short term are just as good as that, or are better than that, than microfracture. And that was a study done in, in actually NFL athletes. So the biopsy procedure itself, here are the places that it can be taken from. The intercondor notch, laterally, right where you do a notch plasty for an, for an ACL reconstruction, the superior lateral uh, femoral condyle in the non-articulating um, and non-weight bearing aspect, an alternate would be the medium femoral condyle in the same area. So um, these are the, uh, the areas as you see right here um, along the intercondylar notch where you'd take uh, um, for a notch plasty, then up on the lateral femoral condyle in the non-weight bearing, non-articulating area. It doesn't affect the telefemoral tracking. And again, any of these locations, I've just never seen uh, an issue with um, uh, any kind of problems uh, afterwards. So the procedure involves using the ring curette or a gouge to kind of map out your cartilage like this and let it roll down or roll up depending on the direction you're going. I, I say it looks like a little pigtail. It kind of, kind of curls up like that. You then grab it uh, with uh, a forceps with, uh, without, with fine teeth and then take that off. And that's gonna be uh, one, of the, uh, one of the specimens um, you'd like to get at least three or four of these slivers. We're looking for a volume of uh, 200 to 300 uh, micrograms, but I'll show you um, in a, next to a ruler kind of what that looks like. So you just have to decide whether you think a ring curette or a, uh, a gouge is better. One, you're kind of pulling, the other one you're kind of pushing, and I'll show you some videos that show that. So here's the technique that I like. Um, so this is this little um, gouge. 
I demarcated where I want it. Then I put it underneath it, the gentle hand right on top of the subchondral bone and just kind of tease that off, rolls up like the pigtail. You come in and grab it and, um, and do several little slivers here. And this is, is barely visible on the side of, uh, 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 of the lateral femoral condyle. That's where I prefer to take it. If there's some damage over here, if there's been a patellar dislocation, something's a problem, then I'll go to the notch in that case. And in the worst case, go over to the medial side of the, uh, of the femoral condyle. Now for the technique in the notch, um, this is uh, Paul's technique. I prefer to harvest from the superior lateral aspect of the notch. Here you see a probe outlining the ACL as well as the lateral aspect of the notch. Also note that this patient has a very prominent sulcus terminalis, which is an excellent landmark for the transition from the lateral weight-bearing cartilage to the patellofemoral cartilage. I find the large open ring curette that comes in the Macy Harvest set makes it very easy to harvest. A gouge may also be used in this regard as well. Although this part of the procedure may be taken lightly, it's very important to obtain an adequate harvest. I would recommend using the edge of the curette to penetrate the cartilage all the way down to the bone and then slowly working your way up the side of the notch, slightly pronating and supinating the hand while keeping constant pressure. If you're not careful, it's easy to slip and injure the adjacent cartilage. Once the biopsy is obtained, it's helpful to turn off the water on the scope to ensure that the biopsy does not turn into a loose body. Also make sure you grab the biopsy by the end so that it easily slides through the soft tissues. Keep in mind that the biopsy pieces should be about the size of a Tic Tac to obtain an adequate harvest. Here you see the biopsy pieces as well as the loose body next to a ruler on the back table. The biopsy pieces are then placed into a harvest container to be shipped off to Varicel. So, um, so then you get the, the, get the specimen and here's where um, prior preparation helps. You wanna have the biopsy uh, kit available um, and the specimen is passed. These, this is sterile, this uh, is non-sterile. The nurse holds this. These are dropped in the biopsy medium. Um, I always recommend doing this over a, a sterile Mayo stand or something just in case somebody drops one on the way up there. It can still be uh, uh, preserved before it hits the floor. Um, but remember that the outside here is not sterile of this. So the specimen goes in here, the three or four pieces, uh, um, whatever you have, it's then sealed, proper identification is there. And um, the circulator nurse will then notify uh, Vericel with shipping information um, for, uh, for pickup. So what do you do um, if you don't have a biopsy kit? And this will certainly happen in situations where you, where you might be at a new um, surgery center or something happened and uh, somebody else used one beforehand. All you need to do is take the specimen when you don't have this, place it in a, a, a specimen cup, put the appropriate label on so you have the things labeled and dated and that sort of thing, just in saline not formalin, not alcohol, make sure you, you stress that. It doesn't go in the freezer, it just goes in the refrigerator. This can wait until the next day or even on a Friday, it can wait till, the, till, till Monday to then be shipped off to, uh, to Varicel, can be placed in the, in the biopsy medium when something happens and a Varicel rep will be, uh, be on top of things and be able to help you with that. So don't let that be a reason that you don't do it but do remember, it doesn't go in alcohol, it doesn't go in formula, and it doesn't go in the freezer. Um, it's key, you know, job's not done till the paperwork's done. So just make sure that you keep the patient information um, and, uh, uh, and go from there. Interestingly, these cooler packs, you don't freeze this. These cooler packs are just more for packing so things don't rattle around. So you don't have to freeze anything when you, when you send, a, send a biopsy. So um, in summary, coordinate with your OR director if you're ASC ahead of time, uh, be familiar with the equipment. I, I would recommend you have a peel pack cartilage biopsy kit. Um, so it's always available, no big deal. Do a complete um, survey of the knee, taking into factors that, uh, that you know ahead of time that you've got from your physical exam uh, and discussion with the patient and, and have a formulation of a plan that takes into effect uh, the size of the defect, the containment, and those type things, 
and then you decide if you need a biopsy, then go ahead and do the procedure. Um, do it from whichever location works best for you. Uh, make sure that you keep complete the paperwork and, uh, and send it off for, uh, for later implantation. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm gonna turn it over to Wayne Gersoff now. Great, well, with the time remaining, um, uh, I'd like to uh, go ahead and talk about what I call the what ifs. And what we're talking about here is that always the situation, people are always asking me about this is, they're starting to do uh, one procedure or another procedure and they see a cartilage defect or they're trying to do two procedures and cartilage repair is one of them. What do you do and how do you address these? So some of the important considerations, as we heard Scott talk about, is assessing the entire knee joint, okay? And that's a very important thing. And always remembering that your best chance of successful cartilage repair is going to be your first chance, all right? Um, so don't go ahead and like Scott talked about, do a microfracture or do something that's gonna change the milieu of that subchondral bone so that it may jeopardize further restoration in the future and resist that temptation that you always have to do something. Because really, sometimes the best decision may to be do nothing at all, but simply take the biopsy and abandon the planned surgery that you had. And always be prepared for what you might find. So let's take a couple of different situations to look at. And I think this situation is probably one of the most common ones that I've come in contact with in my practice over the years. And I've been doing this cartilage restoration stuff for 20 plus years. And this always is the one that gets you is that you have some patient and you're planning on doing a patella realignment or stabilization for their instability patterns. And the MRI demonstrates a questionable irregularity of the articular cartilage or even a very small defect of the articular cartilage. Well, what happens when in arthroscopy, that articular cartilage is worse than expected and what do we do? So let's take this example. So this is an MRI of a, a young woman who's had patella instability, had a dislocation, several dislocation episodes, and you can kind of see a small area of irregularity of their cartilage, but it still looks full thickness and still looks in potentially good shape. Well, when we scope her knee, we see this. So we can see an area here where we can see almost full thickness cartilage loss here, lots of fibrillation, so a fairly significant area of damage. So what are our options? Well, I always include the discussion of this possibility prior to surgery. So when I talk to these patients, I always tell them that our plan is to go ahead and stabilize your patella, realign your patella, but if we see a large or significant cartilage defect that needs to be repaired, we're simply going to debride it, take the biopsy, and come back and do everything at once. And if needed, you can break scrub. And if it's a, a younger patient, go and talk to the family. So I think if you do see this, my thought is you always debride that defect, take your cartilage biopsy and stop and plan to do it all at once. So you have one big procedure and one big rehab. So let's take another, another option. So let's say someone has an ACL deficiency that maybe had a previously documented tore ACL with a bone bruise, but no articular cartilage injury. And maybe they've waited several months before they're gonna go and have their ACL reconstructed or six months or even a year. And they may have had episodes of instability since that initial tear. What happens when at the time of arthroscopy, in addition to that ACL deficiency, we find an articular cartilage injury of one of the femoral condyles. And this, I think, is a very common problem. And as was alluded to earlier in both Paul and Scott's talk, one of the things that we commonly see in athletes when they tear their ACL. So let's see, all of a sudden we see this defect in there. Well, a couple of different options. Well, you can always look at it. Do they have complaints of knee pain corresponding to that area of cartilage injury in the past? And some of these patients may not be able to express that because they might have enough instability in their knee joint that they haven't been really very active. So we always have to take that into consideration. I think important is from a prediction standpoint is the size and location of that lesion. If it's a fairly large defect like we just saw, 
on a weight-bearing portion of the femoral condyle, our experience tells us that that's most likely going to be symptomatic. So you really have two options. One, you could go ahead and proceed with your ACL reconstruction, take your biopsy and monitor the patient for later implantation, or you can just complete your arthroscopic evaluation, take the biopsy and return at a later date to perform both the ACL reconstruction and the Macy procedure. This one's always a tough one because you know, the patients plan this out and they're expecting the, their ACL reconstructed. But again, I think it's better to do one big surgery than go back and forth and do a couple of major surgeries where we have a, let's say, a compounding effect of their rehabilitation. And plus, every time we go into that knee joint, it's a little bit more trauma to that knee. Bone deficiency is another problem that we kind of sometimes underestimate. You know, we usually can see some bone deficiency on an MRI, but we certainly don't know the quality of what we're seeing there. So we may get in there and they may have had of an osteochondritis desiccans or a sustained traumatic injury to the joint that results in an osteochondral defect, but the defect may be such that it's not been displaced, uh, where the cartilage is still there, or it may be a situation where it doesn't look like there's a lot of bone loss, but when you go in there, you find that there's significant amount of damaged bone, even though there's some present. So I think, again, going back to one of the things that was alluded to earlier, is this idea that the MRI is not perfect. It can tell you something's there or not, but it's not going to necessarily tell you the quality. So it may also underestimate that size. So if there's a loose body or hinge flap of osteochondral tissue, that may also be something that becomes a surprise to us. So like in this situation, this young kid had a fairly large defect in his uh, femoral condyle, as we can see here, two and a half centimeters by two and a half centimeters. And on the MRI, that part of the piece was still there and we've dislodged it. But you can see there's not an excessive amount of bone loss. And I think Scott earlier just addressed the idea of what you could do with that bone is you can always go ahead and bone graft it and do what's called a sandwich technique, or you can bone graft the defect and come back later and repair the cartilage. But you certainly want to remove that loose body or hinge fragment. And very important, um, and I think I'll reiterate this, and I think Paul and Scott alluded to this as well, you don't want to take that fragment and use it as your biopsy. It's not healthy cartilage, it's damaged cartilage. It's not going to produce a good cellular repair for you. So you go ahead and assess that extent of the bone deficit and take your cartilage biopsy and then be prepared to either bone graft it or come back and bone graft and do a sandwich technique to fix that. What about the meniscus? And that's a real common one that we see. And we know that there's this kind of symbiotic relationship between the meniscus and the articular cartilage. And so let's say we're going in there to perform a repair or a partial meniscectomy, and we notice a cartilage defect on the corresponding side of that knee joint. So I think a couple of options there. If it's a, if it's a situation where we're going to repair the meniscus, I think you could go ahead and repair that meniscus, take your biopsy, monitor the patient, and potentially come back and fix that defect. Um, if it's a partial meniscectomy, I think you also want to go ahead and trim away that meniscus and go ahead and take your biopsy and again, monitor the patient. I think the, the big question becomes, what if you're in there and that, let's say it was a, a bucket handle meniscus repair and you go in there and you wind up having to take that out because the tissue is so damaged, it's not repairable or like a young man I had the other day, it had been previously you tried to be repaired twice and the tissue was just basically like wet toilet paper. But over the period of these years, when he's had these other surgeries, he also has developed a significant cartilage defect of his femoral condyle. Well, in that case, you might want to go ahead and take away that damaged meniscus, take your cartilage biopsy and come back and prepare the patient for not only uh, repairing his articular cartilage, 
but potentially consider doing a meniscus allograft transplantation because if you go ahead and fix that cartilage and there's no meniscus to absorb that shock, I don't care what you put in there to fix that articular cartilage, it's going to break down and we're going to have a problem there. So I think you want to look at doing both of those and I think they can be done together very successfully. I have a very large number of these that I've done over the years and um, they really tend to do extremely well and it really doesn't compromise the rehabilitation of, of either one of these procedures. Bone marrow edema is a, a big area of discussion. It's very commonly seen in association with articular cartilage injuries, mostly because of that force that's generated to create that the bone marrow edema can damage the, the cartilage itself. What's important to differentiate here is, is that that bone marrow edema is an acute injury that's associated with, or is it a more chronic problem where there's been more, let's say, repetitive stress placed on that subchondral bone? We're also in assessing this, we wanna know, does it appear to be diffuse or is it more chronic? And does it reflect damage to the subchondral bone plate? These are important considerations in determining whether or not you can do articular cartilage restoration. So the, the controversial aspect of this is the etiology or the etiopathology of that bone marrow lesion. And so there can be multiple pathological conditions that cause that. And that's important in your assessment. Is it traumatic coming from a contusion or a osteochondral fracture? Or is it atraumatic, more avascular necrosis or spontaneous osteoacrosis or even osteoarthritis? The difference being you're going to have a different treatment regimen depending upon the etiology of that bone marrow lesion. And when we look at this, uh, the bone marrow lesions themselves, you can look at as not being necessarily indicative of bone disease and really, again, need to be considered in the context of the patient's history. So one of the things we found is that a lot of these bone marrow le lesions that we see, especially after a uh, an ACL tear or a, a severe twisting injury, their knee joint with impaction on it, they will tend to heal. And so if there's a cartilage defect associated with this, most of the time it's really safe to go ahead and repair this. And in the summit trial, there was a, a really big um, grouping of these patients. And the, the summary that was brought out from that was that the bone will remodel and heal with time and the bone marrow signal changes were not excluded in the summit trial. So it really isn't a limiting factor to using cell-based therapy, as long as the EDO pathology of it is that of a traumatic nature. And there's been multiple studies that have shown that the success of autologous chondrocyte implantation in the presence of bone marrow edema can be successful. One of the last guides that Scott was talking about was the environment of that knee joint. And you really need to look in carefully when you're thinking that oh, I'm going to scope this knee and take a biopsy is what is the condition of the surrounding cartilage? Is it chondropenic, meaning very thinned out? Is there extensive osteophyte formation? Um, is there sclerotic, necrotic bone? I've seen patients where, you know, on the MRI, you see a really clear cartilage defect, and you go in there and their subchondral bone basically looks really dead, it kind of has this yellow dead appearance to it. So that is not going to be a good indication for doing cartilage restoration, because just like a road and a road bedding, you need that good road bedding to support the road. Also important to think about the fact that multiple or large lesions don't equate to osteoarthritis. And small lesions are not the same as treating large lesions. And an articular cartilage defect does not necessarily indicate or equal osteoarthritis. Whereas we can see on this far slide, on the far right side, uh, significant osteoarthritic changes. So when you see multiple defects, you really kind of looking more at a salvage procedure and you really need to determine is this osteoarthritis or is it multiple chondral defects? If these findings do exist uh, where there is an osteoarthritic condition, the patient is probably not gonna be a good candidate for Macy, and I, I wouldn't take a biopsy in that situation. So at this point, um, uh, that uh, concludes our situations that we're looking at. 
We're gonna take some questions and answers in the time we have remaining. But one of the things that's really important to look at is um, if you have a patient that uh, is considering doing this procedure, um, we have a system set up where they can call and speak to another patient that kind of acts as a mentor to talk to them about the procedure and what they went through and, and how they're feeling, which I think is sometimes really helpful uh, as opposed to hearing from you who have done the procedure but may not have experienced uh, having it done themselves. So look at any questions that we have. It's a great talk, Wayne. Uh, we, you must have, we must have covered everything, not a lot of questions. I, I did have one question that I want to get Scott and Wayne's um, thoughts on. When you're addressing patellofemoral instability and you're doing your diagnostic scope, you know, there's a little bit of controversy of whether you go ahead and do your osteotomy, your tibial tubercle osteotomy at the, at the initial procedure and take a biopsy, or you, you know, take your biopsy and do your osteotomy later. Um, and there's pros and cons of both. So I was just kind of wanted to get you guys thoughts of, you know, uh, is it a tougher approach after you've done that? You know, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts when you think about that? Um, I think that, um, th I Certainly in, in, the, in the days of ACI, the, the exposure that you can gain when you're doing your tibial tubercle osteotomy makes it so much easier to, um, uh, to, to sew a patch in, in place back in those days. However, now with Macy being a much more elegant procedure in terms of uh, not requiring the, the large exposure and that sort of thing, um, I think you really would have the option to do that. And I think it depends on um, on the patient, uh, what their expectations are. I personally would still favor doing both at once and doing two things at once and recover once, because even though going back to put uh, Macy in after a fulcrosin or antrometization of tibial tubercle or, or even a patellofemoral realignment of, of uh, a proximal, um, it's still, you got to recover and you got to recover with those, uh, weeks and months of uh, limited uh, weight bearing and that sort of thing. And, um, and so I think recovery once is probably the key as much as, as uh, just doing one surgery. So I would favor doing it, uh, doing it um, together. Um, I'll make one other comment that uh, just to the audience, because I know many are kind of exploring uh, cartilage repair. As someone who did his first chondrocyte implantation in 1996, come a long way um, in the last 25 years. And the thing that's impressed me about Macy is it's, it's so much um, uh, more um, reproducible in, in standpoint of time. It can fit into a busy surgeon's um, day uh, to an outpatient setting and that sort of thing. It's not, it's not a two or three hour procedure um, as it used to be. You don't need to get the level of exposure that we used to have to get to sew in multiple 6-0 sutures, 30 or 40 sutures around a, a two by three patch. So it's, it fits in so much better now and patients recover um, much, much, much quicker and much more uniformly. Wayne, what, what do you think about that? So uh, two things, just briefly about the patella. I think, you know, especially in, in all these patients that you're considering doing an MPFL or medial reconstruction, you don't want to have to take that down. So, um, you know, you might as well, if you're going to wait, if you're going to do just your tibial tubercle osteotomy, I would still go ahead and do them both at the same time. To answer Scott's point, I, I think he's absolutely right. Um, and I think one of the big things about the Macy is that the the cell distribution is even throughout the entire membrane. Because one, I think the problems was when we had a patch and we injected cells in growth medium was that because of gravity, you get migration of the cells to certain parts of the defect more so than others. And so you'd get a little bit more robust cartilage formation in one place than the other. Here you're getting much more uniform uh, cell content. But I think one of the really important things to think about though is that even though the procedure is easier and you don't have to sit there and sew, you still have to remember the science and the basic technology of carefully debriding all the damaged cartilage, 
not in, not invasively going into the subchondral bone, getting good vertical walls of cartilage, because that that technology hasn't changed. And so you don't want to say, well, it's easier. I just throw this patch in. You still have to adhere to, to the basic principles. Um, Paul, here's a here's a question from the audience. Um, uh, one of the members asks that um, for someone who doesn't see a lot of cartilage restoration patients, um, how easy is it for them to do uh, a Macy procedure? So someone who might be doing, let's say, three to five potential cases a year, what, what, what's your observation of that? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think a lot of people, as you said, because of how it was years ago, are kind of scared. But I think with the new the new technology, the you know the set, the cutting guides, everything makes it so much easier than it was years ago. So I I think the best way obviously is to go to a lab and practice obviously before you practice on a patient. I think that goes without saying. But no, I, I think this technology that they have makes it very easy. And I think anybody who has gone through a surgical residency is certainly capable of uh, of implanting a Macy patch. There obviously is a little learning curve, but I wouldn't hesitate to uh, to um, to uh, implement. There's there's two other questions. One is Wayne. Um, do you routinely use uh, CPM for Macy? Um, I, I do. Um, you know, sometimes it's a battle getting the insurance companies to agree to that, which really makes no sense. But um, for femoral condyles, I, I definitely will use a, a CPM. Uh, the patellofemoral joint, I'm a little bit more hesitant about. I may use it um, at a very limited basis, um, but I, I certainly... Um, like using it for the femoral condyles. Paul, what about you? Yeah, I, I have not used CPM. One from just like Wayne said, it's it's a little bit of a pain in the in the butt to uh, to get approved. Uh, but I haven't really seen a difference either. I, I think if the patient sticks with their post-operative protocol, which is you know really outlined well, um, you know by the by Macy rehabilitation, I have not seen a problem with that. So I'd be interested, Scott. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I think, uh, it, like, unfortunately, many things in medicine now, uh, the medical, the science doesn't make the decision. The insurance company's perception of science is what the decision is made by. And so you can't let patients panic who say, gee, the insurance company won't lose, uh, won't let me have a CPM. Am I going to fail? And I think that's where your observations come in. That They're not going to fail. You can work on motion. You can uh, do passive motion yourself. You kind of encourage them to do that. But I think with the rehabilitation and just the overall ease of recovery of Macy comparatively, uh, I agree with you that I really haven't noticed uh, a diminution of results. There is one other question someone's asked about um, the sandwich technique, which is goes beyond the scope of our talk tonight. But rather than uh, than than blow it off because it'll be be covered later in in uh, parts two and three. Um, the sandwich technique basically is putting bone graft, taking one of the membranes to contain the, mem the, uh, the, the bone graft, and then putting another membrane, both with cells, um, uh, on top of that one. And so basically you have a cell sandwich, if you will, and, uh, and that's what the repair is. And it's, uh, it, works, it works very effectively. Chris, what, um, how are we doing uh, time-wise? I don't want to keep uh we got a couple more questions there's one about someone's asked about workers compensation patients um i think uh looking at those factors that uh, paul alluded to about the extrinsic and intrinsic factors we know the intrinsic factors that they're a candidate for a cartilage defect but the extrinsic factors in a in a workers comp case can sometimes uh, be the delineator and so I think you, you have to look at those patients uh, as you would for any procedure, uh, be it a rotator cuff or ACL or anything. If they're a motivated patient, they can do very, very well and uh, get excellent results. There have been some, some studies with uh, autologous chondrocyte implantation that uh, look specifically at workers' compensation patients and really have shown that they've done uh, as well as the general population as on all. So, I think uh, Scott was saying is that they have, you know, just because they work with comp doesn't mean they're not going to do well, but you have to assess the fact that they have to understand that it's a, it's a marathon re rehabilitation. 
It's uh, and they have to follow the guidelines. Yeah, I, I would agree with those sentiments. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Caldwell. Thank you, Dr. Golobly and Dr. Gersoff for uh, your participation in tonight's event and, uh, you know, giving us uh, your pearls and tips on, uh, you know, sometimes these really challenging uh, patients with these cartilage defects. So on behalf of Arisa, I would like to thank everyone for your participation. Indication for use. Macy, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. Macy is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of Macy is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of Macy administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimetre squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use Effectiveness of Macy in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of Macy in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. Macy is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other amino glycosides, or products of porcine or bovine origin. Macy is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee, inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. Macy is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months. Excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a Macy implant. Macy is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation program. The safety of Macy in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with Macy are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.